aloha friday welcome to perspectives on global justice think tech hawaii program this is your host beatrice Cantelmo. today we will devote some of our program to talk about indigenous people's social justice issues and environmental rights around the globe worldwide there are approximately 730 million people belonging to 5,000 different indigenous groups across 90 countries these communities often have their own language and deep-seated cultural traditions. Yet, land misappropriation and destruction, unsustainable urban planning practices, agro-industrial development, mining oil and dam constructions, along with high poverty and infant ra mortality rates, high suicide rates, hunger, dehydration, human trafficking and labor exploitation, genocide and houselessness, along with the threat of sea level rise and global warming, plagues the lives of many indigenous people. Mainstream societies are at odds with Mother Earth, who is begging for an Earth revolution. Today's guest is Takaya Vlani. Takaya is an accomplished actress, a singer, and a songwriter, and a native children's survivor ambassador from the Tla'ami Nation, which is located on the Turtle Bay Island along the shore of Salish Sea of the British Columbia, Canada. She's also an amazing social justice activist and advocate. And I must mention that she's only 16 years old. Takaya made it to Hawaii via the Feast Child International's World Youth Congress, which is happening in Honolulu this week. Takaya's spirit, heart, and voice guides her walk and has inspired a new call for the type of art revolution that Mother Earth is in need of. Her call for art revolution is a global action and a movement that is designed and it is empowered and inspired by children and youth to protect the environment and indigenous people from all over the globe. Everyone is invited to take part on this movement because as Takaya beautifully sings, there won't be tomorrow if we don't change today. And on that note, welcome to our show, dear. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> I'm sorry to be here. I'm so happy to have you here. So how are you doing? Um, I'm doing great. I'm really enjoying Honolulu and um, the conference and all of the really incredible insights. Yes. So tell me a little bit about the conference. Uh, so are you mm. here as a guest? Are you here as a participant or both? Yeah. So the World Youth Congress, I was invited to um, participate as a, as a student and uh, be able to, you know, take what I feel is uh, relevant and um, Im important information back to my community and implement it in some way. But also I was invited to perform as a speaker and singer and so I'm just um, having a really fun time. Uh, mm. And uh, yeah. I know it must be very exhausting too, even though it's fun to still be in school uh, mm -hmm. back home and mm -hmm. doing your assignments there, plus the assignments here uh, for mm -hmm. the Congress and the time um, zone differences and, and all of the commitments. It's okay to feel tired sometimes <laughs> in today's Friday, so I'm so mm -hmm. grateful that you're here. Uh, with our viewers. So do you mind telling a little bit, I mean, you've been on this road uh, since you're six years old. How did it all start it? Um, well, I guess I would officially uh, have kind of uh, engaged myself with the activism community um, with the intention of um, being involved on a long-term basis at, at age 10. But I think before that, um, my amount of knowledge of environmental um, mispractices and industrial exploitation and how that had these very devastating repercussions on the well-being of indigenous communities, uh, the soul and freedom of these communities to be able to practice um, in any cultural way and uh, regain a sense of identity after what has been in Canada and in many other colonist countries of a very um, uh, devastating mm -hmm. history. So I think that being aware of the environment of 
subtle systemic injustices that uh, that together become deafening and impossible to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, the Northern Gateway Pipeline, which was the pipeline proposed from the oil sands of Alberta to Kitimat, BC, uh, the amount of resistance uh, that First Nations communities had to this project um, and the, the prospect of you know, you know more in forms of industrial um, destruction and e extraction transportation over indigenous territories uh, it made me feel as if for the first time I have I had been witnessing a thing that my parents and grandparents had had watched throughout their lives and um, I had the opportunity to change it. Mm -hmm. So that was your calling to say, okay, I want to speak out with my voice, the voice of a child, the uh, voice of an indigenous young spirit uh, to help facilitate this dialogue and hopefully the transformation or uh, all of the imbalances that's happening uh, in your neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. uh, but. You know, as a child, and I, I, so you grew up in an indigenous reservation too. Uh, how, how was it, what was happening in terms of the exploitation, the environmental, you know, disarray? How did that impact your life and the life of your community, like that you can recall growing up? What were the things you would be worried about as a younger child? Mm -hmm. um, well, growing up. I would say part time on the Tlaam and uh, reservation. I had, while I lived for a longer period of time in Vancouver than the um, inter intermittent period, uh, uh, group of months that I would travel back, I considered Tlaam in my home first and foremost. Um, I think that growing up, a you have a very tangible sense of um, how the intergenerational repercussions of trauma inflicted in residential schools uh, against those of a um, those who are our fathers and our cousins uh, have these very devastating effects and resurface themselves as addiction and domestic violence, um, teen suicide, mm -hmm. and these sort of social ills that come with a loss of a loss of identity, um, especially for our youth, uh, it's it's difficult being indigenous um, and and being a youth because for for many people they have only experienced the pain. Uh, in an identity that also carries profound beauty. Mm -hmm. So I, I was never formally educated in the ways of, um, I guess, statistics and projections for climate change and how it would impact human life because as far as uh, the survey and the environment impacting human life, I was already convinced, um, and I think that that's important. Just as an that, as an advocate, I I feel it's what I've brought to the table mm -hmm. in sharing my story, in destroying this false division that we have between environment and human communities, mm -hmm. um, and showing that indigenous people are the front lines of climate change, and not only that, but you know, other minority communities, um, those who live in the in the global south. Um, that there is a very human consequence to to these actions and absolutely mm -hmm. not. I don't know story. how much you've learned about um, the people of Hawaii and the other Pacific Islands, but mm. the threat uh, of uh, global warming, you know, is quite real. Not only, um, I mean, first of all, it, it is it, it breaks my heart to hear your account about how difficult it is to grow up 
uh, as an indigenous person uh, and to claim identity and to learn the beauty of it but also have to deal with the stigma uh, of also you know having uh, and, and, and feel proud of an indigenous uh, heritage mm -hmm. I think many people across the globe uh, you know um, can relate Mm -hmm. uh, but I also feel that in many ways there's also a huge uh, movement uh, to a revival you know, of indigenous people's uh, values and, and cultural traditions and, and wisdom which are not always quantified and uh, measured in the same way as mm -hmm. uh, you know, Western culture would like it to be. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it has, you know, value and, and it has, you know, allowed us as human race to be here for as long as, it, as we've been. Mm -hmm. A lot of the issues that we are struggling with now are man-made uh, in the last maybe 70, 80 years. Mm -hmm. So um, there is hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, for us here, in, in the projection is that with the sea level rising in the last uh, next 20 years or to 30 years, that there's a projection of um, you know, 30 million people that are having to leave their homes. You know, so the term environmental refugee is quite real, and I think it, it is up to the youth and to each one of us to recognize what's at stake and to work to not only reverse some of the damages that we are facing but also um, come up with you know ways to get united and to um, bring back you know what is already common human knowledge and I think that the secret is really within the indigenous people and, and its you know, secrets and its treasures. Um, and so I hear that you have um, you know, a big drive, a big mission to uh, initiate this dialogue and to do this push for Earth Revolution. Um, <laughs> You know, with the energy and and uh, everything that has to do with this movement, also that's driven by the children and and youth. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, um, just as a, uh, I guess, I guess technically my label as uh, as someone who's you know performing music would be musician. I, I've always felt sort of uncomfortable with it because um, when I started sharing music about my experience reflecting on um, either injustice or uh, things like the Northern Gateway Pipeline and how the um, very steep um, decline in cultural fluency uh, also paralleled with the steep incline of um, disturbing disturbing uh, epidemics of, of you know suicide and, and you know, substance abuse um, I I could reflect on the situation and when I wouldn't be able to articulate it I would put it into music um, and so Earth Revolution, you know, it, it's not a manifesto calling for an Earth Revolution. It's rather putting a uh, rather, rather silly 10-year-old name on what I, um, on a kind of an optimistic attitude about youth leading the way for um, the design and implementation of solutions for uh, some of the most uh, demanding issues that that we're faced with today and not doing so out of a sense of obligation but also out of a sense of excitement um, because I definitely think that there's there's much to be achieved in the process of um, of planning 
and and moving forward with your community. Mm -hmm. uh, in in Canada, one of our focuses right now with um, Indigenous peoples and our uh, contemporary issues and, and what our communities are currently demanding, it's uh, reconciliation. And so reconciliation being a form of um, not only apology, but um, reparation funds and, and you know, all the, I guess, like adequate funds for social services, education, and uh, health care mm -hmm. allocated to indigenous peoples uh, and indigenous communities, many of which still exist without running um, potable water. Mm -hmm. So we have all of these stories within, within our communities that we have not told for a very long time. And I, I believe that we cannot heal until we are heard. And a part of the process of feeling as if your voice is truly valued and feeling as if you have true agency and um, power in such dire situations is, is the ability to be able to plan uh, for your future and to contribute to a, a greater cause in that. And so I think Earth Revolution was about you know, looking at the um, the negative and and highlighting um, the more beautiful uh, aspects of that mm -hmm. this movement. It's a beautiful movement, and it starts from within and collectively. And I do think you're right. You know, on the core of any issue, you know, which is recognition, uh, you can't move forward without first recognizing the wounds mm -hmm. um, and, and, and having the space to heal. Uh, you know, perhaps you know, that, that process of uh, forgiveness and moving forward, or restorative justice, I would say, mm -hmm. it starts with, you know, all sides uh, sitting down really um, and being able to listen to one another and that's quite a goal for Canada and I think globally too um, so what would the world, like earth revolution look like for you at a micro level like mm -hmm. for indigenous people and for the environment what would you wish to see it happening through the lenses and the heart of a 16-year-old? Hmm. Um, well, I think a part of Earth Revolution um, that was compelling to me at the time and felt necessary to share, um, just the whole idea of singing about issues that might have these really um, uh, detrimental ramifications on your community and of course in that community your your direct family and so what are considered numbers on a page um, and abstract political concepts become these very imminent threats to you that um, are sometimes hard to have conversations about. And so going back to what um, kind of launched me into the, into the path of, I guess, indigenous rights and environmental activism is music itself. Um, the idea that I, I did have something to bring to the table, um, that as a 10-year-old I wasn't formally trained in, in politics and economics and <laughs> environmental policy, but I had a story as someone who had experienced um, the, the devastation, cultural devastation, of, as a result of natural resource extraction. And so a part of sharing that story is, is of course, a part of who I am, and a part of who I am is very much music. And mm -hmm. As for 16-year-olds out there, um, I would just recommend that 
if there is something that you feel passionately about, um, the way in which you contribute to the issue and contribute to the conversation on the issue, it doesn't always have to be as conventional as giving speeches. Um, because I think revolutions need anthems, they need artwork. Um, when we push against the, the wall of a paradigm, we have to do so with the strength of everything that we are. And that goes hand in hand with recognizing the artist and, and the musician and, um, and the many cultures and identities that we have inside us. True. Well, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but uh, in listening to you, it seems like that the arts uh, may always be a part of your path. Um, mm. So the question I would have for you is that, have you thought about what you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting because uh, as far as music, I've always wanted to separate that from any professional uh, career because it's something that still feels very deeply personal to me that um, I don't know if I would be comfortable with uh, selling as a product on a regular basis and um, yeah so it's I, I would feel compelled to continue in the direction of activism but something that's always um, excited me from the age of, you know, first being introduced into this community that was filled with familiar faces of my cousins and, and aunties and uncles and, and soon um, more global stages. The idea of when you get off the stage um, that you didn't just make hollow uh, self-congratulatory um, announcements about environmentalism and mm -hmm and that um, you know, your, your intentions go beyond uh, that kind of public glamour. I've always been really uh, excited to go to university and um, figure out what best suits my skill set and be able to give back in, in a way that's, that's small, that's maybe not glamorous, but um, has a huge impact over years. Mm -hmm. Well, you know you're glamorous, right? <laughs> I think <Yeah>. that <laughs> not <laughs> only for uh, how bright you are, um, but also how much you have been able to travel and to articulate in such a short period of span in your life. You're 16 years old, you've traveled to many countries. I hear you went to Brazil, you went to Korea, you're here in Hawaii, you spoke in front of the United Nations. Mm. I mean, that is so inspiring. Mm. Um, and you spoke from your own heart and your truth, mm -hmm. which you believed it was the right thing to do at the time. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that will always be the energy that will propel you moving forward, uh, you know, to stick to your own truth. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure that your path will be very enlightened and that what we do with environmental work and politics, um, mm -hmm. activism is very important. Mm -hmm. But I think it's the essence, you know, that part of connecting people, connecting people's hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability to open new spaces for dialogue, you know, it's, it, that's the real goal. The, and you got it, girl. <laughs> you really do. Yeah, I, I, I do think that, you know, when, when political discussions um, become so abstract that, uh, that the people and communities very intensely affected by such issues become hypotheticals, then nothing um, nothing gets done or no connection of empathy is made and I think when you have people who um, you know maybe are not scientists so they can't share objective truths that are um, gathered through you know their their methods but can share a story of, of their life and their experience um, like my cook and my grandmother and grandfather said 
um, don't be intimidated if if you're making speeches. Um, you know, you're going to be surrounded by by adults who uh, will have a very different way of delivering your same message. But remember who you are, where where your seat or hat, where you go uh, for a reminder of, of your roots. I see that most of your <laughs> pictures in your career, you carry this lovely hat. Would you <laughs> mind telling us, our viewers a little bit about uh, the, the symbolism and the, the tradition behind it? Yeah, so cedar is a sacred building material in Coast Salish cultures. Um, the Islam and culture, we believe that cedar has uh, cleansing properties. Um, it can hold a space for ceremony. And so not only do we incorporate elements of cedar into our arts, but basically um, every area of our, of our life, from, from the material that we build our houses out of, to utensils, to um, even our clothing, is made from cedar, and so it, I, for my family and for myself, it's it's more than um, having a, a more visual representation of the culture that that I'm bringing to the table, but it's also uh, you know we believe that the ancestors are are in these practices. We believe that the the ancestors you know we sh we stand upon upon their shoulders with, with their strength. And it is a, as indigenous youth, um, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's a process of self-discovery, digging uh, beneath the pain to find the beauty in identity and um, bringing our ancestors with us. Wow, it's really profound, so beautiful. We're almost at the end of our show. And I want to uh, leave you with three Tupi Guarani words. Uh, I, I'm, I'm also a, Bra I'm a Brazilian national and an Italian mm. national, and I'm half indigenous. Um, and I didn't have a chance to really learn uh, about my culture, you know, my indigenous roots and the language mm -hmm. as much as I wanted to. I'm claiming that now, you know, mm. in this stage of my life, but. I want to share these words with you because I think that they already speak to your heart. So the first word is kurumi, which means child and youth. May you mm. always remember, you know, and carry that energy of kurumi and extend mm. that to all the kurumis around the globe. Whether you sing, whether you're silent, whether you speak at a very fancy place or just one-on-one -on -one with another person, yeah. Kurumin energy will always be with you if you allow it for that to happen. Mm. The older word that I have for you is Nye. And Nye means uh, the two inexchangeable meanings. And it means wood in itself mm -hmm. and the soul. And the interpretation of the meaning of this word is that your soul comes through your words. So never be silent, or at least not for too long. Mm. Nye, nye, be always be with you. And the other word is mutironyo, and that means uh, gathering. It's an invitation, um, which I think all indigenous people have uh, as a core base of uh, sustainability, mm. is that we don't do anything on this globe alone, uh, individually. It's a collective, interdependent, interconnected action, always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that concludes mm -hmm. our beautiful program. Uh, and uh, so, so touched to hear the voices of uh, our youth and, and their wisdom and their clarity and their uh, genuine purity. So may our viewers carry that for the rest of the week. And until next Friday, ahoy ho.